Don Shelton. Well, there have been so many glowing words to Claire this day so far, and I chose to put a few highlights of my 54-year experience with Claire into sort of a letter. And uh, here we go. Dear Claire, as I look back on our 54-year friendship and our relationship, both personally and musically, I'd like to say a big thank you for just a few of the things that were highlights in my life. First one being your incredible time as the accompanist for the vocal group, the Hilos. I, I first met you in 1958, and we both had red Austin Healy's. And I remember how exciting that was that we both had the same car. And then after that, music took off, just like our cars. As, as the accompanist and conductor for the Hilos, we were in uh, New York City, facing Street East one night. And uh, we had had, it was a very incredible night with Andy Williams and tons of celebrities there. And, and we closed, our encore was Nobody's Heart, a beautiful Rogers and Hart piece, and it was a cappella. And we had no plans for how to get off the stage at the end. And we finished, Nobody's Heart Belongs to Me. And then, and instinctively and intuitively with Claire's incredible musical sense, he went right in to what we had just sung as a boo boo do dee da da do da and we walked right off the stage and the audience was going nuts. And I looked over at Claire and I said, you nailed it. <laughs> Nothing planned, he just, out of a clear blue sky, this is what I should do to get them off the stage. <laughs> Now, and then I have to thank you for being a wonderful roommate during all those years with the Hilos. Because don't forget, you introduced me to yogurt. Dan and yogurt. Oh, we used to buy it at Christetti's Market around the corner from the Manga Windsor on 6th Avenue. And we'd keep it. Claire said, let's open the window and we'll sit it out on the windowsill. And it'll be nice and cool the next morning. And sure enough, it was. And I still love yogurt to this day. I also thank you for being so privileged to play and sing on so many of your incredible musical projects through the years. And also for being such an influence on my playing. You helped shape an entire different way of, of thinking about how to shape a melody, not only after shaping the melody, to improvise on it. And so for that, I am very, very thankful. Also, the brilliant compositions and arrangements for the world to share forever. Among them, of course, albums and things that we did with the Hilos, and then later with the Singers Unlimited, recording in the Black Forest. And, uh, of course, we will never forget your incredible arrangement of Tenderly, which we sang just about every night, every show that we ever did. Most incredible vocal arrangement you can possibly imagine, and I, I miss singing it so much. And it was, again, Dear Claire. And, of course, another highlight would be our duet concert in Vienna. A few years back, we were invited to play at Mozart Hall in Vienna. Just two people, just Claire on a huge Bosendorfer, and me and my clarinet, flute, and soprano, and voice. I did sing a Portuguese thing that Lorindo had written, and Claire loved that. And for one and one-half hours, I was overcome by Claire's magnificent on, magnificence on this gorgeous Busendorfer. I, I equate it to like a, a tidal wave of sound. I mean, talk about digging in. It was incredible. And I, I just had to, when Claire poured that over me, all I could do was just do my thing and come right back in and, and do uh, my woodwind things. Also, your quest for excellence. It always brought out the best in those fortunate enough to be in your inspirational presence. And that is so true. So thank you, thank you for your musical sensitivity far and away above the ordinary.
May you rest in peace now as you mingle with those giants who preceded you. You were one of a kind and you won't be forgotten. So till we meet again, goodbye, dear friend. Zoanne Fisher, my father's ex-wife. Hello, everybody. If, oh, I'm sorry. Before, before she starts, there, there's a little bit more room if some of you need to get out of the sun. The yeah, if some of you want to sort of cross over here and, and be in the shade or, or, or go on to that side. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Zoe Ann Fisher Shilcock. Claire and I met at a party in Malibu. I was charmed and delighted by his spirited conversation and his passion and love for music. I was fascinated. We talked for a long time about everything. We talked about some of his favorite composers, and the ones I remember most vividly were Bela Bartok, Igor Stravinsky, and Mussorgsky. We actually went to a concert at UCLA where Stravinsky was conducting the Firebird Suite. I actually loved Ms. Orkski and Stravinsky. I had taken many years of violin lessons and loved classical music. Claire's first gift to me was Ms. Orkski's pictures at an exhibition. We were married two years later. We lived in a mid-century post and beam modern home with clear story windows and beautiful forested and canyon views. It was high up in Laurel Canyon and on a clear day the view was spectacular. The mountaintops to our east and the valley floor below were amazing. I used to get everyone up when it was clear so we could all enjoy the beauty of this particular place where we lived. The early years were an exciting time for Claire. He was composing his own music and writing and performing for the high lows. Some of the beautiful compositions that most of you are familiar with were written during these years. He would get up in the morning and practice by playing little Mozart pieces for the piano or Bach. It was such a joy for me to listen to his genius every day. It was a happy time for us. It was lovely listening to him play, whether practicing or composing. To hear his music every day was an amazing gift for me and later on for our children. We had a beautiful black standard poodle named Baki. We named her after the Bachianas Brasileras by Villalobos and she would love to lie on her cushion under the piano and listen too. Later on, our children would join her under the piano listening. Once in a while, Baki would bark at something when he was recording, and he would just laugh and start over. We loved that wonderful dog. You saw Claire and Baki, one of them with that big, fluffy, almost unrecognizable dog. That was, that was our Baki. The early years I think but difficult, trying to get his own music out there to be recorded or to be hired to write arrangements. Things did not just fall in his lap, but he was a highly motivated and hard worker and he never stopped writing. Some of his early jobs were playing for many wonderful singers and he loved it when he got jazz gigs at Shelley's Manhole, The Lighthouse, The Baked Potato, or Dante's. He, he was inspired and inspiring to, to so many students, peers, and the music and listening world in general. Claire's musical signature was distinctive and immediately recognizable. His chord voicings, improvisation, his touch on the piano, and compositional style were fiercely innovative. In 1964, our son Brent was born, and in 1966, our daughter Talia was born. He was a devoted and loving father. I thank you, Claire, for a beautiful and talented children. About several years ago, Claire was hired by a 20-piece orchestra in Germany to arrange pictures at an exhibition by Mussorgsky in a jazz format. Claire was unable, was unable to do the arrangements, so Brent stepped in on his father's behalf and wrote the entire score. Brent has continued to archive, document, and record the extensive Claire Fisher Library and will continue to carry on his father's legacy by carrying on the traditions his father first conceptualized. 
About 20 years ago, Claire married his high school sweetheart, the beautiful Donna. She has lovingly taken care of him and has been his lovely muse for all his later years. They have had a great life together. The gift of Claire's brilliant music will live on in the hearts and minds of those who knew him and those who know of him. Sleep in peace, Claire. Mike Lang had something. Is he here? Dear friend? Stephen Yields is a turn of which. Dear Claire, you were the first and best friend I made in Los Angeles. I loved every minute of the time we spent together. I loved your intensity, your commitment, and your uncompromising ethics. You were one of the few people I met in Los Angeles who actually knew what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I'm the same age you were when we first met at the, at the Big Potato. And I have to tell you, you were always very hip. <laughs> you also proved to me, once and for all, that white people can dance. <laughs> <laughs> you are incredibly, incredibly generous with your gift, and I thank you for having written a song for my daughter Marcella when she was born. Not one day goes by that I'm not touched by that gift. I love going to restaurants with you, talking about languages for hours on end, sharing our brand, our own brand of self-deprecating humor. I still believe that you have some Jewish roots. <laughs> <laughs> and most of all, just listening to the third movement of Shostakovich's fifth and crying our eyes out. Claire, you were never afraid of speaking your mind never afraid of showing your emotions, and never afraid of the truth. <clears throat> Although your life was not, by far not, struggle-free, your soul remained intact, and you always kept a remarkable, childlike naivete. I am so thankful for have, uh, having had you in my life. Hmm. You and my father were born exactly on the same day, and I always considered you part of my family. I learned a lot from you. By simply being yourself, you forced me to question everything in my life. You were truly thankful for everything you had and always eager to share that with others. You were and always will be in my thoughts and in my heart. A big teddy bear an inspiration, a professional hugger, <laughs> and a person who truly, truly knew who he was. Generous, funny, not non-materialistic, and incredib incredibly caring. Much above being the great musician that you were, your biggest talent was being the greatest friend a person could wish for. Thank you. Albert Marx production. And Claire, um, I, he came to see us play with Cal Jarrett's band, or Albert Marx did from Discovery Records. Went out to Arizona, uh, Tucson, to see us perform with Jader to see if he want, really wanted to sign me. I, I guess he liked the way I played, and he signed me. He, he left me with a 12 page contract, Albert Marx did. The next day, Claire Fisher rented a car from Tucson to Phoenix. That's what, about an hour drive, an hour and a half. He says, Poncho, you drive and I'll read you the contract. Because, I mean, that's how great he was. And he's, 
I was driving and he read a 12 page contract <laughs> word for word to me and he would stop and say, Poncho, do you understand what that means? <laughs> and half of the time I'd say, no, I don't. <laughs> He goes, that means you're going to get this much if this ha He explained the whole contract to me by the time we got to Phoenix. That's about an hour and 15 minute drive. And so that's the, way, the kind of guy Claire was, and I love him, and I'm going to miss him dearly. And the last thing, just a funny piece, there's many of them. Uh, we were playing with Cal Jeter's band up north near San Francisco at one of the colleges. We went early to do a sound check. We did our sound check, and they invited the whole band to go have a prime rib dinner. So we said, yeah, let's go eat some prime rib. And they had everything, prime rib with dessert, everything. We sat, we ate, and then we had four hours before we were going to hit. So I told Rob Fisher, the bass player, no relation, Rob, at Rob said, Poncho, you want to go down the street to the liquor store and get a six-pack of beer? We got some time before we hit. I said, yeah, let's go. Let's go get some beer. And so your dad said, well, can I go with you guys? We said, yeah, we're going in the van to go get some beer, you know, down the street. We went down and, and got a six-pack of beer, and, put in, and we were coming back in the van, back to the concert site, and all of a sudden Clara said, oh, look, there's a jack-in-the-box. And we went, <laughs> so? We just ate prime rib with dessert and all, and you say there's a jack in the box? Rob, he told Rob was driving, I was sitting shotgun, and Claire was sitting in the middle. He said, he said, pull in there, quick, pull in there. We went, gotta be kidding. And we, he pulled in there and got in the jack in the box line, and he's going, what do you want from here? You know, he goes, I want, for, oh no, first he goes, do you guys want anything? Do you want anything? And he said, well, Claire, we just ate a prime rib dinner. We just want our beer, you know? And he goes, okay. Get me seven apple turnovers. <laughs> seven apple turnovers from Jack in the Box. They gave him seven apple turnovers. We took off and they were, there was a bag down here and I'm shaking my head. This guy wants seven apple turnovers. We took, we took off and he immediately started eating two of them fast. <laughs> fast and I'm looking at him like, damn. And then Rob Fisher said, looked at me and said, what the heck, I guess I'll get one. As soon as he put his hand in the bag, Claire grabbed his hand. <laughs> He said, those are mine. I asked you guys if you wanted anything, I would buy you anything. Those are mine. Stay away from them. I love you. say anything. I didn't want to say anything, but as I sit here and I listen to Don's wonderful description of the latter days that he spent with Claire and uh, this incredible career and legendary presence that he has made in the, in the times since we were roommates, I just want to, I just want to let you into a, a, a different side of Claire because Claire and I were roommates on the road with, when I was with the High Lows. And we, he came with us in, in uh, I believe it was in, in Detroit, wasn't it? Uh, and he it was a simpler Claire Fisher. Uh, he was full of all of that music, but he doesn't didn't talk about it. We don't talk about music. We, we, we just so my life and my time with Claire was always full of laughter. Everything was funny. We talked about women. We talked about bodybuilding. We talked about body parts. We, Claire was a earthy person, and he was full of fun. And you would never—I never would have perceived that someday he would be Dr. Claire Fisher. You know? And here he is, Dr. Claire Fisher. God bless you. I miss you, pal. But I wanted you to know about a simpler time. So the simplicity of Claire, besides all that deep and structured and amazing harmonic uh, uh, foliage that he puts around his music, is one little thing, and I'd like to leave you with this. Yeah. Logically so, right? Logically so, yeah. One of my dad's originals.
You know, I, I just realized we've been sitting here talking about the harmonic genius of Claire Fisher for all this time, and, and I forgot to mention, actually, Dad was quite capable of writing rhythms, and not rhythms like three against five or something like that, but he was, he was capable of writing very unusual rhythms that gave all of us trouble, right? We sat and looked at them. It's just simple combinations of dotted quarters and quarters and eights, but in unusual places that you wouldn't think they should go there. And we all struggled with that, right? But we, we eventually got it after being yelled at times. And, uh, and so it was a wonderful experience.